We are now live. Uh, welcome everybody to the August 12th, 2020 meeting of the City of Brentwood Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, I do not have a flag in my place of residence, so I think unless there's an objection, we can dispense with the Pledge of Allegiance, although God bless America, certainly. Uh, any no objection. Okay. Roll call, no please. No objection. Lisa, can you handle roll call? Uh, yes, Yolanda was going to you get the sheet. Her. Sherry Bilderbeck. Here. Michael Deming. Here. Mark Fabazio. Here. Rebecca Jacobs. Here. Jeff Moore. Is that me? Here. Paul Moran. Hello. He's Hart Nelson. Nelson. Here. John Neuberger. Here. John Ritter. Lisa. Here. Sharing. Here. Sharing. I'm sorry. Tom Shipley. Here. Tom. Hey. Is that everybody? Yes, that's okay. Very good. Is there any objection to approving the minutes of May thirteenth by acclamation? No objection. Then they'll be approved by acclamation. No objection. I'm sorry? No objection? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll move forward into new business. Uh, we have one item on the agenda this evening, which is an amendment of the conditional use permit and site development plan for Brentwood Promenade to permit a gaming use for property at 83 Brentwood Promenade Court. Is the applicant present? We are, Chairman. Okay, very good. I cannot see you, but uh, if you could please introduce yourself and introduce your a proposed amendment, please. Ah. <laughs> Very good. I see you, sir. Very nice view you have there. Thank you very much. I'm actually calling in from a little bit of a vacation today, this week. Please proceed. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, at this time, I'd like to just introduce our team. Uh, it'll be myself, Anthony Perno. I'm representing Nerd Street Gamers, uh, along with Tom McCracken, who is the Chief Financial Officer for Nerd Street Gamers, uh, Tiana Walters, who is the General Counsel for Nerd Street Gamers. We also have on this call uh, with us this evening, Dan Murphy with APEC Signage, in case you have any questions regarding the signage application portion of this. I also have with us this evening, uh, Keith Fitz from Site Centers, in case you have any questions uh, from the landlord uh, associated with this particular application. And then we also have um, Zach Mintner uh, from Five Below, uh, who represents our specific landlord and our partner in this particular endeavor. So answer any questions you have along those lines. Uh, with this uh, introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Tom uh, McCracken. Uh, also, I also have Joel Velarde, I apologize, Joel. He is the Vice President of Operations. Uh, in the event you have any questions for us in reference to the operations of Nerd Street Gamers and how we operate not only here in Brentwood, but across the nation. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Tom McCracken for him to be begin our presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Anthony. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Is everybody able to see my screen? Yes, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Terrific. All right, I'd like to thank everybody for your time tonight. Um, you know, I'd like to give everybody first a, a quick preview of who we are at Nerd Street Gamers, specifically the local host concept that we're looking to install uh, in Brentwood, Missouri. And then I'm gonna turn it back to Anthony to hit some of the zoning considerations specifically. Uh, Nerd Street Gamers was founded in 2017. Uh, we opened our first local host location in 2017. Over the subsequent couple of years, we, we had a number of strategic investors, including Comcast and Five Below. 
Buy Below Today is also a partner of ours looking to open additional localhost stores. One of which is the site we're looking at uh, and looking to open in Brentwood, Missouri. Uh, in addition uh, to stores over the past few years, uh, we, we also dabble in media production uh, and event production. Uh, we've done a number of events for uh, uh, pro sports teams. Uh, we've also done uh, production for ESPN just a few months ago. We did their Celebrity Matted Challenge, uh, and we were also nominated <clears throat> just recently for a couple of uh, Emmys for a line linear TV show that we produced for NBC Sports uh, called For the Win. So that's a little bit about us. Before I jump into some more specifics, I always like to just kick off with what is esports. Um, <clears throat> It's a kind of a buzzword. Not a lot of folks really know what it's all about. And pretty simply, just like traditional sports, football, baseball, basketball, esports is competitive gaming. Uh, it's typically done via console, so Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, or via a PC, a personal computer. Uh, it's a pretty big industry now. It, 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 we broke a billion dollars globally last year, and, and by a number of studies, uh, it's looking to, go, to grow tremendously over the, the next uh, several years. Esports, though, does have an accessibility problem. That's a lot of what we're trying to cure at uh, Nerd Street Gamers, uh, really on, on two fronts. Uh, one is for the gamer uh, and, and also the, the workforce that doesn't really exist today. Uh, when you think about esports, if you have any frame of reference, you typically probably think about uh, maybe one of the pro teams, the Overwatch League, maybe a, a pro gamer that you, you know of. No one really has a frame of reference below that because the infrastructure doesn't exist today. So that's what we're trying to bring to market uh, from a gamer from the gamer perspective. Um, you know, there's a lot of barriers of entry. You need upwards of five thousand dollars of equipment. Um, even if you have that, uh, you're not going to have <clears throat> the internet capability to game at home. There's also integrity issues, uh, and then also from the workforce perspective, given that it's a relatively new in industry. Uh, there really isn't the workforce for a number of jobs that are needed to execute uh, a number of esports uh, uh, businesses. So we have a number of educational and development and camp opportunities uh, that we offer as well. So our solution, it's really a three-prong approach. Uh, the facilities, which is what we're here to talk about, the local host facility we're, we're looking to open. Uh, that's really the infrastructure, the, the, the PCs and the venues. Uh, the events is the, the programming that we run daily, uh, so competitive games or competitive tournaments rather, camps, educational programs, uh, coaching, things like that. And then content's an important piece as well uh, because there isn't that infrastructure, there isn't that minor leagues, there isn't uh, the little leagues that, you, that traditional sports have uh, to get discovered within esports, the content element is critical as well. So lastly, before I turn it over to Anthony, uh, just a couple more points I wanted to hit specific to localhost. Um, we have two different models that, uh, <clears throat> that we install today. One is our larger regional facility. So there we're looking at a 20,000 square foot plus facility. Um, you know, a, a lot of competitive gamers, you're, you're going to see spectators, you're going to see a bigger media production. Um, that's not what we're looking to do at this venue. Th this venue is, is one of our pilot programs or pilot stores we're, we're looking to open with five below. It will likely be the, the third to open. Um, it's a much smaller, more intimate uh, setting, uh, really focused around uh, creating those opportunities for the competitive gamer to, to get involved with tournaments, uh, as well as some of those educational opportunities, uh, the, the camps, the coaching, uh, et cetera. Um, there, won't be, there would not be spectators in a venue like this compared to our bigger venues. We will not have that, uh, uh, those types of events, uh, as well as the media production. Uh, there, there may be one or two fixed cameras on the stage, which you can see a picture of that on the slide here. This is actually our Austin uh, location, our very first location with Five Below that we opened just a few weeks ago. Uh, so from a media production, it, it won't be something elaborate like we would, might do at our regional. We're talking about a couple cameras fixated on that stage there. And the right picture here you can see is uh, a picture from the entrance of the store facing back uh, to the back of the store. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, you know, I, I talked a bit about gaming, so it, it's simple to, to maybe draw the comparison to, to an arcade or, or something like that. But what we're looking to do and what we do do is far from it. You know, for starters, that there's one point of sale here, sale here, unlike an arcade where, you know, you, you can drop a quarter and, and there's, you know, kids and youth running around, around the whole venue. There's one point of sale when you come in. It's a membership model. So when you come into the store, you, you do have to check in, you have to register, you have to become a member. We always know who's in uh, the site uh, uh, at any given moment. 
Uh, there's also also virtual games, meaning that you could be gaming with someone in one of our other venues across the country, something that uh, wouldn't happen at a typical arcade or gaming center. And then lastly is the educational development opportunities that, that I touched on. We, we run camps, Sunday programs, um, <clears throat> there's coaching that goes on to not just learn about gaming, but the industry of esports uh, and uh, everything that goes with it in terms of, you know, getting a job, becoming a tournament operator, getting involved in broadcast, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Something that, that wouldn't go on in a typical uh, arcade or, or gaming center. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Anthony to hit some of the, the zoning considerations. Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate it. Before I continue on in this aspect, I just wanted to make sure there was a, is it appropriate to take questions during our presentation or will you ask all the questions at the end? Yeah, why don't we do it at the end? If that's okay, Mr. Perno. No, that's absolutely fine. So walking through the balance of our operation, just to put a little more flavor on it, what exactly is happening at this particular store as part of our partnership with Five Below. One, we see ourselves in a symbiotic relationship with Five Below where part, part of our, what we believe is going to happen with our partnership is that we're gonna drive retail opportunities to Five Below and the other surrounding stores within the complexes that we go, go inside of. And there's a number of reasons why we believe that that happens. One, uh, the most commercial businesses right now are struggling with the idea of how do I get consumers to leave their houses and not just order online? So what we're finding is that we're trying to create an inelastic opportunity where those consumers have to come to a store to actually do something. Because of the nature of our competitive gaming, in order to keep an even playing field and the integrity of the game, as Tom was explaining, you need to come to the store. You can't just play online because there's too much of an opportunity to cheat. And so it's a real opportunity for us to kind of bring the consumer out of their house and into a place where they need to go. What we find also is that right now, the average uh, individual who comes and trains at our stores trains for about four hours at a time. And they come in teams, usually between three and six individuals. Most of these games are three player games, six player games where you need to coordinate and practice your attack strategy uh, in the competitive gaming field, not just as a, as a person by yourself, but as part of a, a team effort. And so what makes training for that very, very difficult when people are on different playing devices across different locations. And so here's an opportunity for us to do that. We see that time frame in that, in that area when they bring somebody out, when they are done gaming, they have an opportunity that, well, I'm already here, the store is now closer than me ordering online. It's now more convenient for me to walk to the target, walk to the five below and pick up the items I need than going back home and reordering and having it sent to my house. I can pick it up as an on-demand item. So as a result though, what we are asking is that our hours of operation mirror that of five below. We're not looking to extend beyond the hours of five below, but whatever hours of operation of five below is operating at, we would like to be able to operate within those same hours uh, going forward because we'd like to really push this uh, symbiotic relationship with them. At the same time, in the photos that you saw, we take this, the competitive gaming portion of this very, very seriously. And so as you see, in a small, narrow corridor that we have, uh, we can only appro fit approximately 62 people uh, training at any particular time at this facility. And so even though our space by code would be rated for 87, uh, we saw the recommendation that uh, planning was saying, hey, if you only need 62, we'd like to limit your space to 62. We see no objection to that because we don't foresee it. There's not enough space for spectators to come into the space and potentially tap somebody who's playing, which could cost them their game. And so we don't want to allow that opportunity to occur. So for us, the integrity of the game is just as important as anything else. And so having those players who are very serious in this game, being able to play without a spectator or someone trying to bump into them and ruin their game is also equally valuable. And so we see utilization of the space of being capped at 62 people at the, at, at the time being. Uh, that brings us to some of the parking elements, which I know was a, a potential concern, was something that we had spoken at length uh, with uh, the zoning officer about this. And uh, right now, approximately 35 to 45 percent of our attendance across the country, both in Colorado, which is in a suburb location outside of Denver, uh, Philadelphia, uh, which is which are, which are both operational. What we're finding also in Texas is about 35. Uh, to 45% of our people who attend our facility either come by walking, biking, or car share, with the majority being car share. Um, in addition to that, what we find is that the average person who comes, because this is a game-oriented sport, they are coming approximately 2.5 to 3.0 people per vehicle. 
um, in, a, in coming to, a, to, a, to the facility. So what that means is that we, the space itself within this area already accounts for 10 parking spaces that would be allocated to this uh, square footage within the current development. We would foresee using approximately 12 to 13 parking spaces at peak. And again, because of the low turnover, you know, training happening roughly on, at four hour increments, and we pre-schedule everything, you know, unless there's space, a walk-up wouldn't, wouldn't be able to just come in and play. Um, you know, there, there, we don't foresee, even at peak capacity, we're looking at about 13 to 14 cars uh, coming in and not coming in necessarily all at once and, and hammering the facility. The parking at the facility uh, has more than enough uh, parking to accommodate what we have, and we have site centers on board uh, who also believes that is true. Uh, because the site, the, the facility has four cars per thousand spaces, per, per thousand square feet, we think makes up that, that, that differential. Uh, one additional thing that we wanted to kind of identify is that the demographic of our players, two thirds of all the people who actually come into our competitive esports uh, uh, gaming facilities are between the ages of 18 and 44. And so this is not necessarily a young crowd. Uh, this is a, a group of um, adults for all intents and purposes, who are really the, the group that is, is coming in and playing this, playing these games and being very serious about it. And so I just wanted to kind of highlight that uh, just to see if you had any questions. Um, that would conclude our presentation for now. We will be open to any questions and try to just see how we can answer any concerns you may have about the application. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Perno. Uh, before I open it up to the commission, uh, I'll just say the only question I really had was parking because this is a heavily, heavily trafficked area of Brentwood, this Brentwood promenade. Uh, so I would just ask that uh, Ms. Kirkmeyer, that the city take note of the representations that are being made uh, by the applicant and to the extent there is an issue moving forward, we can always revisit this, but I wanna make sure those representations are, are taken into account because I don't want, this isn't a less, you are in a less trafficked part of Brentwood promenade, but I will, as you probably know, uh, this, this target in particular is a very heavily trafficked area. But your representations are noted and I will open it up to the commission for questions. Okay, I can't see. So can we uh, go back to the home screen here? I will stop sharing my screen one sec. There we go. There we go. Very good. Okay, are there any commissioners that would like to ask a question of the applicant? Uh, Mr. I, just had a, I had a question. Is anybody here from uh, Micro Center or Dobbs and or uh, Five Below? And do they have any issues with parking? Good question. This is uh, Zach Nintier. I'm the Vice President of Real Estate of Five Below. So I'm, I'm here on behalf of Five Below. And uh, no, we've studied this, we're in this partnership with the Nerd Street and we don't feel there's any adverse impact to the uh, parking here at, at this particular location uh, and certainly others that we're looking to do a partnership with them. Okay. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Hi, okay, Mr. Chairman, this is, this is Paul Moran. I'm on the phone uh, and not on Zoom. I said a question about the, uh, the other facilities that have been opened by this group and how they are trending in terms of their expectations and uh, how many people are going to them uh, right now, the ones that have already opened. Thank you. Sure, I, I can touch on that. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, we, we opened our first location with Five Below just two weeks ago. Um, we, and although we opened it, it was a soft launch. We have yet to actually go public and, and uh, do any form of outreach. So it's really early to say, um, other than, you know, we continue to look for additional locations to move into. We're, we're both very happy with the partnership. We're bo both very, um, uh, confident that when the world starts to spin again, that, that we're going to see the same demand we saw before the pandemic, which was, uh, very, very strong. We were seeing, uh, you know, our sales in, in our couple of locations, uh, double at that point in time. So um, <clears throat> we're very confident that we'll get back to that at some point in time right now. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're just working on getting, uh, you know, these hand, handful of pilot stores open. Okay, Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when I hear gaming and I understand esports, I work at a college, it's a big field now for us. 
uh, but just want to make sure uh, we're not talking about gambling. We're not talking about will basically any money be exchanged other than the time purchased, basically, or coaching or that sort of thing. Just want to make sure I understand that properly. Gaming, gaming can mean different things. Uh, in sure. Missouri, yes, cer certainly no gambling. Um, we do uh, time to time do um, events where there could be a prize pot on a Saturday night. Um, it's it's not. I, it's not considered gambling. It's it's a portion, frankly, of, of the, the ticket proceeds that go uh, towards it. Um, that's not a daily occurrence, um, but that does happen time to time in, in some of these tournaments. Thank you. No other questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Okay. Do any other commissioners have any questions for the applicant? Are there any? Yes, yeah, Paul Moran again, Chairman, Mr. Chairman. I just wondering if there's a minimum age of uh, individual allowed in the place. I'm just wondering if, I'll tell you why I'm asking, I'm wondering if people would use this as a babysitting service while they're shopping at Trader Joe's, Target, and other places in the area, leave the kids, kids in their gaming, and if there's any risk associated with that. Sure, there is. Uh, Tiana, uh, you mind taking that question? Yeah, no problem. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. I'm Tiana Walters, General Counsel of Nerd Street Gamers. Um, so there's no minimum age to enter. However, we do have a minimum age when you can be there without a parent. Um, so we do require that anyone who is under 13 have a parent present while they are there. Between 13 and 18, they have to have a parent that, lead, that is there and uh, they may be at five below, but otherwise they need to come back before they leave. Um, so, and we also have parent waivers on file associated with any child that's permitted to participate in our facility. It does the parent and or the child have to purchase the membership just to enter the door? At this time, no, the, the memberships are free. Um, and then typically what, what you do is you buy a, a, an hours package, four hours, eight hours, 12 hours. Um, to, and that's the, the hours that you can then use on the PCs or the consoles, the Xbox, the PlayStation, et cetera. Okay, any other questions from commissioners? Is there any uh, member of the public yeah. that would like to address the commission on this? Okay, Mr. Moore, did you have something else? I didn't, but to amplify what uh, Commissioner Shipley spoke to, which was Dobbs and um, Micro Center in the conflict that they've had with parking. Um, I don't know if our applicants are aware of that arrangement, uh, but there are no, what appears to be visible parking spaces in front of the Dobbs Tire and Auto Center are theirs and not, um, have any, there's no access from the shopping center to those parking spaces. So they would, it would seem to me that Micro Center would have some feedback on this application. One, it would have to be benefit them in terms of the people that uh, that Nerd Street is drawing. Uh, however, the parking I think could be exacerbating the problem. Well, there certainly seems to be no objection from the landlord and. I would just, uh, that, was, that was my primary concern. Um, I just wanna make sure that the representations are noted so that to the extent there is an issue down the road, uh, we can revisit oh, this. Oh, have some questions. Hi, this is Keith from Site Centers. Um, I'm not aware of any parking issues with those two tenants. Uh, I've talked to our property management on site and um, they didn't raise any concerns whatsoever on parking. Okay, anyone else from the commission or the public? Uh, yes, Michael. Uh, from your other sites, as I know you said you've just only been open two weeks, is there, and maybe you've addressed this, what time would you say would be like your peak hours when you're gonna have the most people there? Sure, it, it depends on the time of the year. Um, you know, summer, summer can be busier depending on the geography uh, when, when, when some of the you know, youth is out of school. Uh, but typically, uh, afternoon and evening is is where we're going to do most of our business.
Anyone else? And if not, the uh, we will entertain a motion. Chairman. I would like to make a motion to recommend approval of this application as submitted to the Board of Aldermen. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Sounded like it was from Mr. Shipley. Uh, the one thing I would note, is the applicant aware that there were some conditions that were noted on the staff report that was submitted by the city? Uh, we are aware of those. Um, we there. Did we had requested that the staff conditions, uh, the one staff condition be modified um, to the hours of operation would be uh, in, con uh, in conjunction with the hours at five below. I, we, at least I don't know if that was modified or not. I, I know we had transacted, it sounded like that would be acceptable. Yeah, the, the staff report had already gone out, um, but I did have it duly noted in my report, so I was gonna make mention of it. So I don't know if it would be all right to express it just that the hours of operation shall be 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., although currently that isn't five below hours. If the commission members still feel like there maybe ought to be a nighttime restriction, just in case five below would have longer hours, I don't know that they would. Um, or again, they could maybe just adopt language if they want to include this condition that again, the hours would parallel whatever the five below business hours would be. That seems reasonable. Does the applicant have any objection to the conditions with the one condition being modified to allow for the hours of operation to be alignable with those of five below? No objection, Chairman. Okay, seeing none, is the move on and the uh, the person that made the second, are they accept, are they agreeable to those that motion uh, incorporating those conditions? I'd like to amend my motion to state that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Mr. Second. Shipley? Okay, very good. Any further discussion? All right, roll call, please. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Technical difficulty. Sherry Bilderback? Yes. Mark Favalazio? Yes. Rebecca Jacobs? Yes. Jeff Moore? Yes. Paul Moran? Yes. Hart Nelson? Yes. John Neuenberger? Yes. Lisa Schifrey? Yes. Tom Shipley? Yes. Uh, I think we had Mr. Ritter also. He came in after. John Ritter? Yes. Mr. Moran as well. Okay. Yeah, they got me. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I think so. Everyone, I believe, was involved in the uh, the roll call, correct? Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, this one then this application for the CUP would be taken to the Board of Aldermen at their two meetings in September. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Perno, Mr. McCracken, and Ms. Walters. Thanks, everyone. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Uh, Court, I, I apologize. Lisa, I cannot pronounce oh, <laughs> Just Lisa. <laughs> I just want to thank you no for problem. your time. You're, you're incredibly help, helpful through this process, and we just wanted you're to welcome. acknowledge your specific assistance. Um, thank you for the board. We appreciate your support. Very good. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is the nomination of officers. This, uh, my understanding is it should have been taken up in June, but I don't think we had a meeting back in June. So let's just uh, go through this. Are there any nominations for chairman of the commission? Nominate Michael Daly. Like to... <laughs> All right. I'll second it. All right, Mr. Nelson. All right, any other nominations for chairman? Okay, are there any, nom and then my understanding is Ms. Kirkemeyer, we vote on this at the next meeting? Correct, we'll have the elections at the next meeting. And there'll be an opportunity to do, uh, to make additional nominations at that time as well, commissioners. Yes. Are there any nominations for the vice chair position? I'll nominate Mr. Tom Shipley. Tom Shipley, you two are hard. Oh, Mr. You Moran, did. you tried to grace us with your video there. Thank you. Well, yeah, I don't think I'm doing anybody any favors by showing my face. 
Now, here I am. My evening. Thank you. All right. I'll so second that. We have a nomination for vice chair and a second for Mr. Shipley. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Okay, and we also have a secretary position. Are there any nominations for the secretary position? Nominate Mr. Nuremberger. Second. The motion is second to nominate Mr. Nuremberger to the secretary position. Are there any other nominations? Okay, very good. And the commissioners will note that they will have the opportunity to make additional nominations and we will vote at the September meeting. Aldermanic report, are there any aldermen present or women? Hearing none, city planners report, Ms. Kirkmeyer. I would like to just go over very briefly a ordinance that will be presented for first reading to the board this coming Monday. This is something that I know is of interest to the Planning and Zoning Commission because how many times have you all uh, had projects that you reviewed, applications, and of course stormwater issues come up all the time. So we have worked with the Public Works Committee since, oh gosh, last fall, about, about nine months now. We hired a consultant, the city did, Horner and Schifrin. So staff, Horner and Schifrin, and the Public Works Committee has been working on this ordinance, as I said, for several months. And again, we are to the point now we're going to present it Monday night. But I just wanted to give you just kind of a, a very general uh, framework of how this new ordinance is, is going to be implemented. So um, a lot of times when projects do come before you, of course, they're commercial or industrial in nature, maybe multifamily. And they're usually sizable projects where they're over one acre in size that they're going to disturb. So there really isn't going to be any changes with that. Any projects that serve over one acre of land are going to continue to be going through MSB's kind of rigorous process. There's really no reason to duplicate that. We always have the, their review on file. We have their permit on file. Um, but there are projects that come before the Planning and Zoning Commission that maybe are disturbing less than one acre. And so then we, again, review the stormwater plans that are submitted, but that's usually later in the project when they come in for the building permit, and they also have to provide to us their um, stormwater prevention plans. That all gets really reviewed at the, at, as I said, more the building permit stage. So, and then let's talk about residential, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and jump into this new ordinance. So for residential projects, we've been having the same issues with stormwater, or especially infill development projects. And so this ordinance will now capture many of those projects as well. Obviously, there, you're not working with one acre size of a parcel for residential projects. So this is going to capture any residential improvements that have an increase of over 200 square feet of impervious surface and are projects that are gonna be reviewed by the ARB. So again, it kind of has to meet those two criteria um, because what we're now, if this ordinance gets adopted, what's going to be required for these applications now will be that they do have to uh, apply for a stormwater infill development permit. And so as part of that permit, what they'll have to do is uh, do more contour work and everything and they're going to have to design whatever that differential runoff is going to be to the MSD standard, which is how do we take care of the stormwater if we had a 1.14 inch rainfall. So we're applying the same MSD standard, but for these smaller projects. And so as part of now this process, if it goes to ARB, they're going to have to already have filled out this stormwater infill development permit. And then uh, they'll have to show with their permit what the existing or the pre-calculations, drainage calculations are, as well as the post-drainage calculations. And whatever that differential runoff is, they're going to have to submit whatever their, the best management practices that you're going to use in order to be able to control this additional runoff. So I think this is just a, a home run, if you will, in terms of really having um, numbers to look at and to review. and um, so what will happen then is when they complete their stormwater infill development permit, we really don't have the resources or the engineer on staff to be able to review it. So these permits, we are also taking in the next month a 
on-call contract with an engineering firm to review these stormwater infill development permits. So we will have a, an engineer on retainer that will review it. So the ordinance, if you've had a chance to read through it, you'll see that there is kind of a charge for that uh, review fee. But again, this has been vetted by the Public Works Committee. I think they're very comfortable with this. It's not gonna capture all improvements, but I think this is just going to uh, go a long way with really starting to address some of the stormwater issues in Brentwood. Okay, and just for the record, the commission is not uh, expected or required to make any recommendations or uh, offer any approvals on this, correct? Right, the ordinance itself is going to be part of the municipal code, but it fits into chapter 500, which is the buildings and building regulation section of the code. So if it was something that we had to change in chapter 400, which is zoning, then that would have also been reviewed by you as well. Uh, but again, since this is an amendment to chapter 500, that was not necessary. So this is more for information purposes. Um, and I'm here for questions or if you want to follow up with anything in a few days when you've had time to read it or think about it. But I just wanted to let you know this legislation is uh, is ready to go to the board. I think it's a good it's a good ordinance and we've been working on it for quite a while. Okay, well, thank you for the update. Any questions from commissioners? Lisa, what's the um, what's the fee to the, the homeowner applicant who wants to make a uh, improvement to their property from the city? for the engineer to review the right so um we have a deposit that they would um include with their permit fee or with their permit application and uh wanted to go ahead and up oh, here we go sorry about that it's on page uh four if anybody does have a copy of the ordinance but we have in here a fee that if it's going to be site improvements resulting in less than 500 square feet of an increase in pervious surface, then there will be a review fee of $500. If it's site improvements resulting in greater than 500 square feet, then there is a review fee of $1,000. And that will be a deposit. Um, that fee will include the initial evaluation by the engineer and then their written comments as to if it's approved or if changes need to be noted, and then one more resubmittal to see that it's compliant with our with our code requirements. Thanks. Any further questions? Anyone from the audience? Citizens want to address the commission? Okay, thank you, Ms. Kirkmeyer. Mike, I have one question. Yes, sir. I just uh, want to say you wanted to maybe have a vote about meeting in person next time. Not oh, yeah. All, not everybody was on the call then. Yeah, thanks. Let's do that under other business. Thank you, Mr. Nuremberger. Uh, okay. we have any other issues on that city planner's report? All right. Thank you, Ms. Kirkmeyer. Uh, no need for a subcommittee rationale, um, Ms. Kirkmeyer. And then other business. Yes, two items. One uh, may not be up to us, would be meeting in person moving forward. Ms. Kirkmeyer, is that up to us or is that a city decision? So it is going to be up to the individual boards and commissions. Now, we do have to still follow whatever the St. Louis County regulations would be. Since this is kind of a larger body, we would still have to make sure that we can stay under the threshold of, you know, how many people can meet in this room. Um, if we're at 50%, then we can have, uh, I believe it's 24 persons in this room. If we're, if they, the, they would scale it back to the 25%, which is what we were under for a while, then we are limited to 12 persons in the chambers here. So we would have to be to, mass, masked up the whole time is another consideration. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely we would have to still have mask and social distance. So um, we did have one live since COVID, we had one live board of adjustment meeting and it was back in June. But again, it's a, it's a smaller group and we were able to hit all those parameters and it wasn't an issue. There is also currently a protocol for uh, any visitors to City Hall to follow which is a temperature taking kind of sign in thing. And again, wear a mask the entire time that you're in here, so. 
Okay. Well, these things seem to change day by day. So it, unless someone has a, we, we can just take this up closer to the next meeting. We're not going to meet till mid September. So we can see how it goes. It'd be good to see all of you in person. So hopefully we can meet in person. My understanding was that St. Louis County when Sam Page did his last thing around August, actually it was on um, effective August 1st, is that he went back to the 25% capacity unless he's changed that in the last like 11 days, that's where it's at is 25%. I have panic attacks every time I put on a mask, so it's a major problem for me. So I don't know how I'll do depending on how long a meeting is. Um, I, I would love to get back to in-person meetings and I'm honestly not worried about the, the COVID situation at this point at all. I just have major PTSD mask anxiety, so. Okay, well, there's no problem. Certainly if someone wanted to participate by Zoom, there'd be no problem with that, but um, we, we can revisit that. There's a month from now, so we can revisit that and see how it is at that point. Uh, if we do meet remotely, I know we had talked before about meeting at six o'clock versus seven o'clock. And my understanding was that six o'clock may be an issue, certainly if we're meeting in person. Is that still an issue if we're meeting remotely, the six o'clock meeting? Not for me. Not for me. Okay, anyone? Um, no problem for me. So to the extent we have remote, pro, uh, remote meeting, We'll plan on the six o'clock meeting. If it's not remote, I mean, we can revisit the meeting time at that point. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay. All right. Chairman. Okay. Chairman. Ms. Kirkmeyer. So we, we do have a published uh, meeting <coughs> schedule. Okay. So I'm trying, and that is what developers and applicants go to look for for the meeting time. So just for clarification, um, we can adjust it. Do we do we want to go ahead and adjust it to 6 p.m. for the rest of the year? Okay. Well, well, for are the there 20th. any issues to the extent we did meet in person? I don't remember who had. I think it may have been somebody that's off the off the commission now. But are there any issues to the extent we would meet in person with with starting at six o'clock? No. No. Sounds like that's okay then, Ms. Kirkmeyer. Okay. Yeah, it's so okay. Will... It's okay with me. Now. Okay. Yeah, that would be better because like tonight the whole group was in a different time zone. So, but I will go ahead and republish then the 2020 calendar at a 6 p.m. start time for the rest of the year. Okay, very good. Any other business? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Bilderback, second by Mr. Nelson. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Hope Take to see care. you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.